Okay, so today is our final day. Um, so we have a lot of goals that we want to hit, but I will try to uh, do things at, at a you know comfortable pace, not rushing anything. So yeah, let's get to it. So I'm going to share my screen, and I took the liberty of uh, writing up a little recap of yesterday um, to save us some time and also to jog everybody's memory. So if you recall, where we left off yesterday is we were trying to prove the weak mortal they theorem. And one of the key steps, or rather, we, we reduced the proof of the mortal they theorem, sorry, weak mortal they, um, to proving this theorem, which is uh, basically a theorem about if we place ramification conditions on the cohomology classes that we're studying, then the quotient we cared about, which if, if you remember, the quotient we wanted to show was finite was this guy. So maybe I should put this in red um, just to distinguish it. Okay, so we wanted to understand this quotient and show it was finite. And um, so, you know, if, if we look at the, the result that we have here, then this uh, gamma module M is playing the role, or rather we are, we're having it be, uh, take, sorry guys, take the M torsion of A and take its uh, KS points, where KS is a separable closure of K. Okay, so that's, that's just a recap of, of sort of how this applies to weak mortal day. And then, you know, I mean, the, the theorem speaks for itself, but what we did um, proof wise is we reduced to, let me get a wider thing so that I can better move around the text. Okay, right, so last time we reduced to um, a particularly nice case, right? So uh, first of all, we wanted to have the nth roots of unity contained in our base field K, which remember is a global field, um, setting us up for a, for a Kummer theory type situation. Then we wanted to have our, um, our M just be a cyclic group essentially. So we, had it, we want it to be the nth roots of unity. And last of all, we want to have the places of K uh, that are associated to M so, you know, if, if K here is, is Q, then really you're just factoring M and looking at the primes that appear. Uh, you want those to be contained in your, um, your set of exceptional places. So recall that S is a, a finite set of places on K that contains the infinite places. Okay. So then our goal uh, that, that we didn't get to was trying to construct an exact sequence of the following form. So we want an injection from the quotient of the S units uh, by the nth power of the S units into our unrarified cohomology classes. And then we want that to map to the M torsion of our S class group. And so then this establishes the finiteness of our unrarified cohomology class stuff because, well, the, the uh, S class group is finite by a, uh, a classical theorem in, in number theory. And then over here, we have the S unit theorem, which says that uh, the S units are going to be finitely generated. When we mod out by the nth powers, what we're doing is we're taking a full rank subgroup. And so this thing is torsion, which means that it's finite by the you know, fundamental theorem of uh, finitely generated billion groups. Okay, so that's hopefully a recap, a good recap of where we are. And so, we need to obtain this exact sequence here. So let's do that. Okay. So here's how we're going to go about it. We want to recognize this subgroup here. So the, the unramified cohomology classes with respect to S, we want to recognize that as a legit uh, first cohomology group of an appropriate uh, field or rather field extension of K. So what field extension are we going to take? Well, here's what it will be. So let's have L be the, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll say it this way. So it's the maximal unramified outside S extension of K. All right. So how do we get this field and, and what the heck does this mean? Well, first of all, I'll tell you how we build it. 
So it's obtained as the uh, compositum, right? And recall that the compositum of, of fields is just the smallest field that contains all the fields in your collection. So it's the compositum of all finite, oh, unrarified outside S extensions of K, right? So it's built up from a bunch of finite data, um, as is the case in a lot of, you know, infinite Galois theory, you, you really only need to think about um, the finite extensions and how they fit together. So when I say that it is uh, unramified outside S, you know, for a finite extension, this should hopefully make sense, right? You look at the places that come from S and you think about their extensions. Uh, sorry, you think about the places that are outside of S, you think about their extensions to whatever your, your uh, extension field is, and then you say, okay, you know, how, how do they factor, right? You just do your usual ramification theory. And then to say that an infinite extension is, is unramified or, you know, unramified outside of some set of places, is to say that all of its finite sub-extensions are unramified outside the set of places. So um, it's clear from that, that that indeed we take the compositum to get it. Okay, so uh, why do we care about this field? Well, it has some nice properties. Um, one of them is that it's Galois, so L over K which I will note is almost certainly an infinite extension, right? So if we take S to be empty and we take K to be Q, then uh, it's a classical theorem of number theory that in fact L is just Q. But otherwise, if S is not empty, then um, by dealing with discriminants, you can show that in fact L is going to be infinite. So this is going to be some massive extension. and it's not Galois in the, or the manner in which we note that it's Galois is not the usual one in these sorts of contexts, right? Because ordinarily the way that we would say um, an extension we encounter or an infinite extension we encounter in algebraic number theory is Galois uh, would be to say, okay, well, it's built up from these finite extensions that are all obviously Galois. And then the data contained within the Galois group of of our extension, or sorry, the if we look at automorphisms of L, the fixed K, well, they're going to be dealing with finite amounts of data at a time. And so if you know about the finite extensions, then you know that the whole extension itself is Galois. Um, but in this case, that's not true, right? Because if you take K to be Q, let's say, and you take S to be, you know, some prime, right? Then we know that the, uh, the primes that will ramify are precisely the ones that will define, divide the discriminant of whatever extension you have. And so uh, you could easily cook up examples where this, uh, this extension is going to be built up from things that are not Galois. So then why is the whole extension Galois? Well, this is because, um, basically, oh, <laughs> sorry. Systems fighting with me again. This is because different roots of the same uh, irreducible polynomial in K join T give rise to. I'll say uh, related relative discriminants so again this is this is relating to ramification theory but basically yeah the idea is that um, you know it, the worry would be that you're, you're obtaining this extension l over k um, from extensions of k that you know maybe don't contain like individually they don't contain all the roots you'd be looking for but because you specified places and all the discriminants you, you're gonna want to care about that govern ramification will be related to that, then in fact, um, 
the roots you're looking for will be contained in some other extension. And so when you take their compositum, you will actually end up with all the roots you're looking for. Okay, so this is a Galois extension, which is great. And I'm going to have G be the uh, Galois group of the extension. There we go. Okay, so then uh, we also have a ring OL, and we can have this be the, uh, the compositum. So this is going to be a ring compositum taken with respect to subrings of L, if you will. So let's have it be the compositum of these. Uh, oh, shoot. Hold on. OK, OK. So you, you, have to, you have to be a little careful about how this works if you're dealing with a global function field. Uh, but for a number field, this certainly works. And you can do something related for, um, for a global function field. So take OL to be the compositum of OE ranging over let's say e over k finite unramified uh, outside s or sub extensions i guess So I'll say sub extensions of L. Okay. So this this guy is going to act as sort of a um, you know in, in in ordinary number theory or algebraic number theory you'd want to do um, cohomological arguments involving these uh, these valuation rings and so here we have a sort of catch all guy that contains the data of all of them. Okay. So the reason why we care about L is that um, it's going to be exactly, basically, okay, sorry, so, so let me see this. So we claim that again, H1 S K mu M is just H1 G, so this is going to be Galois cohomology mu M. So that it's, you know, we don't have to worry about this subscript S. We, we have an honest cohomology group and we can do honest cohomology computations where we look at a long exact sequence. Okay. So let me scroll down. Uh, kick that. All right. So how do we get this? Well, we know basically by, by arrangement that gamma acts on mu m trivially. I think, I think somebody needs to mute. Okay, so we know that there's a, there's a trivial action of gamma on mu m. And so what this tells us, right, is that h1 k mu m, which is, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the group in which this subgroup is contained is just going to be the uh, continuous homomorphisms from the absolute Galois group gamma into mu m. Okay. So that's fine. And if we look at these guys here, right, um, or, or rather, okay, so then what this tells us, right, is that H1 S K mu M consists of, and then I guess it should be uh, yeah, can can somebody mute? I, I hear noises. Hold on. Let me let me take care of this. I'm I'm muting I'm muting myself again. Sorry, I keep fucking this up. No, 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 you're you're fine, you're fine. I'm overly particular about it. <laughs> okay. So Right, so we have this continuous map such that, uh, well, we have to impose the ramification condition, right? So the restriction of psi or reverse psi to 
the inertia group is going to be one. Notice that we're writing things multiplicatively uh, for every closed point. U inside of U, which recall from yesterday that big U is, is spec of the uh, ring of best integers. Okay. So um, if we look at elements here, right, these homomorphisms, well, they have to vanish if we restrict to the inertia groups, right? So that means that what all the data of this map is actually contained in what it does on the rest of the absolute Galois group, right? So if we look at the absolute Galois group and we remove the union of all these inertia groups, then that's the data that actually determines what this map is. Because again, all this is forced on us, sorry, all, all of, uh, this, this forces a lot of constraints on this map, right? But um, what that means is that actually our, our Gaia Xi is contained by, or is determined by its action on G. And one way that you can see that, so I don't want to say too much without writing, so this implies that elements of this are determined by their action on G. Um, if, if this seems, you know, if you're a little skeptical about this, then just note that um, Kummer theory gives you a very nice way of understanding uh, the, co the first cohomology of, of K with respect to mu M. And uh, what it says, so just note, so by, by Kummer theory, Let me pan down. Okay. This guy is isomorphic to, and I, and I noted, I said this yesterday too, but it's, it's still important. So this is isomorphic to the units of K modulo the nth powers. And there's an explicit isomorphism between the two of them, which is given by identifying A the class of a unit here with a map I'll call Psi A, which recall that, you know, because of the triviality of the action of the absolute Galois group on mu M, then these are just continuous homomorphisms from the absolute Galois group into mu M, uh, where Psi A is entirely defined by uh, the following. So if I give you sigma in the absolute Galois group, then psi A of sigma is um, sigma of alpha over alpha, where alpha is an mth root of A. And you can you have to check that all this is independent of choices, but it is. Okay. So then the, the, the claim, which I invite you to, to prove for yourself, that hopefully draws, makes the connection between makes this, this relationship to G more plausible is, is this, um, that our guy Psi A is unramified outside S, you know, in the sense that its restriction to the inertia group is trivial um, at, at all the relevant close points, or rather, let me, let me focus on a particular close point. So it's unramified, uh, at a close point U if <clears throat> any extension of K, well, we already, we've already chosen some M through, right? So why not just look at that? So if, I'll just use that guy, K of alpha over K um, is unramified at you. Okay. So then we have a relationship between the sort of cohomological ramification and the uh, number theoretic ramification. Okay, cool. So this is reason to think about L 
And so now we, we are in business to do um, the usual thing you would do with group cohomology where you write down a short exact sequence and then you recover the, the sequence we want, which I'll remind you is uh, this guy from uh, the induced long exact sequence. So let's, let's get that long exact sequence. All right, so I claim that, so claim the following short exact, or the following sequence is, is short exact. So we have one mapping to mth roots of unity, mapping to the units of OL, to the units of OL by mth powers, and then to one. So this is, short exact sequence of groups. Um, and the proof of this claim, well, exactness at uh, mu m here is, of course, just the, the notion or just the idea that, you know, this is injecting in. And it's injecting in because we arranged that the m roots of unity are contained in the units of k. And so, of course, they're contained in the units of l as well. No surprises. Um, because this is contained in there, you know, we have the full kernel of the nth power map, you know, defined on maybe k star. And so, of course, uh, we have the full kernel here. So exactness at the middle term is, is also fine. So all that we have to check is exactness at the second copy of the units of, of the well. And that's just a surjectivity criterion, right? So <clears throat> how do we do this? Well, uh, yeah, let's pick some A and OL cross, and we want to find an mth root in the units of OL. That's, that's exactly what this is saying. Okay, how do we do that? Well, let's have alpha in, I guess, the uh, units of a separable closure of K be an mth root, right? So a priori, we, we don't know if it lands in L, but, um, Certainly, it's contained in the separable closure. Okay. So then we let E be any subfield of L adjoint alpha such that, oh, sorry, such that E over K is finite. Then there are two possibilities, right? So, so then either E, oh, too many lines. Either E is a subfield of L, you know, that's finite, or it's F adjoined alpha for F, again, a, a finite subfield or a subfield defining a finite extension of L. So what, why does this matter? Well, what we want to do, right, is say that um, L adjoined alpha has to be unramified outside S, and then by the maximality of L, this will force alpha to actually be contained in L, right? So basically, if, if E is going to be some finite subextension, Right, because that's exactly how all this data is built up is from finite subextensions that have ramification conditions. So if E is going to be a, a finite subextension of L adjoint alpha, then either it's contained in L and there's nothing to check, and so we move on with our day, or it's of the form F adjoint alpha for F a subfield of L, which means that all the ramification that has to happen would have to happen outside of F, right? Because again, F is contained in L. And ramification is a sort of phenomenon that carries up the chain, right? If you have ramification, so let's, let me say this. So if you have L, E, K, and ramification happens here, then that ramification also lifts up to here. And so, um, or rather it lifts up to this, this composite extension. Uh, so that means that, again, all the funny business would have to be happening when we actually join alpha. 
So that means that we just need to show that get, you know, throwing in alpha that doesn't do anything funny. Okay. So um, let's have uh, P alpha of T uh, contained in uh, the polynomial ring over OF be the uh, minimal polynomial. of alpha, okay? So then what we can say is that the minimal polynomial divides uh, t to the m minus a, right? Because certainly if we plug in alpha, since alpha is an mth root of a, then the polynomial on the right here, t to the m minus a, is going to vanish, so the minimal polynomial divides it. And well, this basically gives us what we want. Right, and I'm not going to write all this out, but basically, um, right, to check whether we have well behaved ramification, we need to pass to suitable quotients. And this guy, t to the m minus a, if we take its derivative, right, maybe in a residue field, it'll be m t to the m minus one, and then the minus a part goes away. And we already know that m is well behaved because we arranged for it to be an s unit. So that tells us that this guy is going to give rise to unramified extensions outside S. And that means that the minimal polynomial is also well behaved, which tells us that alpha is contained in L, essentially. So dot, 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 skipping a few steps. And check the notes if you're curious. Um, alpha is in L. So that implies that, that E is a subset of L. And this implies that you know, L adjoin. Well, I, I, don't, I don't even need that. Sorry, <laughs> don't even need that. It just says that alpha is an L, and that means that the M root actually existed, and that's surjectivity. Okay, so that's uh, yeah. <clears throat> Zach, yeah. Uh, um, so for for the Kummer sequence to be a Schurzak sequence, the statement is that you need M to be divisible in whatever base thing you're working with. That's it, right? You don't need all the M. You don't need all the M with a unity to be in like the base scheme or the base thing you're working over. Do you? No, no, we, we don't, but we needed that. Um, we needed that earlier in order to like, yeah, for this particular statement, it's not important, but it was important um, for us to look at L in the first place, right? We needed the Coomer theory uh, behavior, which is for example, this thing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Just making sure. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. 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 So, so just to, I guess, let me, let me say that one more time a little bit more clearly. Right. So all that matters for this Coomer sequence type result is that M is convertible in our base. And then the fact that we contain a full copy of M three of unity um, was useful earlier to relate L and its Galois group G uh, to the setting that we care about. Uh, but yes, this, this, doesn't res this result doesn't rely on the full, full power of the statement. Okay, so cool. We have this uh, short exact sequence. So that means that it's going to induce for us a uh, long exact sequence. And uh, let me note that, um, and, and this is something that I, I sort of glossed over, uh, but all of this is compatible with uh, the Galois group action with, with G, right? So this is a, a, a G equivariant type thing. So that says that um, it induces a long exact sequence in uh, G cohomology. So that's important. Okay. Right, so um, let me just write down the portion that's, that's relevant for us. Oh. Yeah, it likes to make those lines vertical for some reason. Okay, so we have G mu M, and we have G O L cross and G O L cross. Okay. Once again, mth power maps give rise to mth power maps on the cohomology. Okay. Cool. So this is the uh, a part of the long, or this is part of the induced long exact sequence. And what we want to do is identify it with something a little bit more familiar. 
So we already said that we can identify this with um, our unramified cohomology classes, which is good. These guys can also be identified with something more familiar, and that is just the S units. Okay, and the map that goes between them is again still nth powers. So why, why is this S units? Well, um, basically because uh, if you were to replace G here by gamma and uh, replace OL cross by uh, Oh, I guess, I guess that doesn't make sense. But ba basically think about it this way, that um, this is just looking at the G fixed points of the, uh, the units of OL. And the way that, that that should be, it should definitely contain a copy of uh, the S units. And then, let's see. Oh, right. So that, that should be the whole thing because it should all be, um, it should all be like, the G fixed point should be all data arising from the K level itself. And this is exactly what that data is. I realize that's a little bit imprecise. Um, I can make that more precise later if you want me to, uh, but I, I, I claim that this is not like anything super surprising. Okay. So then let me draw a arrow here, which these things are not aligned, which is going to drive me crazy, so I'm going to move it down. Okay, cool. All right, so then what about these guys over here, right? So, so let me note, first of all, that this first half already gives what we want for the first part of our, um, our, our exact sequence star, right? Because um, what this says is that there's an injection from the S units mod the nth powers into our modified cohomology classes. So that's great. So then over here, we have uh, H1 of G with uh, coefficients in, in the units of OL, right? And this should look a lot like, well, Picard groups, right? Namely, um, again, we want to have something like this appearing over here. We want to have the Picard group of OKS and the Picard group of OKS. So this is the S-class S group, right? And the map that goes between them is tensor mth power. Again, we want this to be exact, right? Because then this will say that this maps to the m torsion of the S-class group. Well, thankfully, and this is one reason why we set things up as we did, this S-class group is related to this uh, cohomology group here. So let me change here to this cohomology group. Um, and the relationship is, is nothing all that fancy. Um, and I, I think these, these should actually be embeddings, although I, I don't, I'm not going to prove that. But how, how does this work, right? Well, um, yeah, well, g give me a second. Okay, sure. So the S class group is going to be the, you know, the same thing as the Picard group of U, where U is, is the spectrum of OKS, of the S units. And then this is just isomorphic to, well, a, a first atal cohomology group. So this is the first atal cohomology of U with coefficients in GM. Okay, this is a, a standard result, um, but it's useful. Okay, and then this guy, um, H1 uh, G with coefficients in OL units. Well, this is also a first atoll cohomology group. It's the first atoll cohomology of spec OL with coefficients in GM. Okay. And so uh, what this, what, what then the map is between 
uh, these two guys, well, it's induced by the, uh, the corresponding map in the opposite direction uh, going between OL and the S units, right? In particular, there is an inclusion from the S units into OL. And that induces uh, this map on cohomology. And then, and then uh, I believe this is a, an injection. Uh, and so then what this gives you is that the data of the top exact row transfers to data of an exact bottom row. And hence, we obtain the exact sequence that we were looking for to begin with. OK. And yeah, that concludes the proof, actually, because again, as, as we showed before, this, is, this gives finiteness. Um, so before I move on to uh, other stuff, uh, I want to ask if there are any questions. Does, does this work for global local, <clears throat> global functional fields? Because over there, you definitely have P. It's not. Um, like ETL, so does like so in characters P do you have no control whatsoever over the P torsion? Uh yeah, the P torsion is kind of whack. Fortunately, we're not looking at P torsion, right? Because in that case, we we would have restricted to the case where M and P are relatively prime. Right. So does does the weak Mordell V theorem doesn't hold for the P torsion in characters like P? Mm, mm, mm. Um no, I believe not. Okay. Cool. Other questions? Okay, awesome. Yeah, and, and I just want to note that this does have to be modified slightly just in the way that we define OL um, if you're dealing with a global function field because, you know, what do you mean by OE in that case, right? The, again, the, the added difficulty with function fields is always that there's not some uh, like global analog of the ring of integers, but I, it's, it's, it's not that big of a deal. Um, so I would say, don't worry about it too much. Okay, cool. So we are now on our finishing stretch. This will be our, our last bit of stuff that we do uh, to prove Mordell Bay. Uh, and so in order to streamline things, I want to give you a roadmap before we begin, right? So, um, let me first remind you of what the mortal Bay theorem says. So it says, uh, let A be an abelian variety over a global field K. then uh, the set of k rational points of A is finitely generated. <clears throat> OK, so how does a result like this follow from the things that we've been doing so far? And the answer to that question is provided by the following um, theorem, which, whose proof um, is elementary, but I will leave uh, to those who are interested to check out the notes or just want to have a fun little exercise. Um, it's just an induction argument, essentially. Uh, but here we go. So I'll say proposition. And I'm going to use gamma in place of A, so there's no confusion. So let gamma be an abelian group. Let's have M be an integer at least two, such that uh, not a gamma mod m is finite. OK, so this should make you think of the weak mortal bay theorem, right? Because replace gamma by the, well, by the k rational points of a. And then we know that this quotient is finite. Again, as, as we said, um, you choose an appropriate m prime to the characteristic. OK. So we have a finite quotient. And then um, suppose there is uh, 
Ah, come on. There's a Z bilinear pairing. Which I'll write this way, which goes from gamma cross gamma to R. Uh, that is symmetric positive semi-definite. We don't need it to be positive definite, but semi-definite will work. Um, and satisfies A, uh, a finiteness condition. And this is the finiteness condition we will try to, um, to prove. So if I take A in gamma and I pair it with itself, and I want that to be less than C, this should be finite uh, for every C greater than zero constant. Okay? Then, Gamma is finitely generated. And again, I invite you to prove this on your own, but let's think about what this will mean in our context, right? So um, we're going to, we, we already have the first half again by weak Marshall Bay. And so then the second half, we're going to need to build a bilinear pairing um, on the K rational points of A that has these nice properties. Right, so it's going to need to be symmetric, positive, semi-definite, and satisfy this finiteness condition. Um, so all of the effort that we do for the rest of today will be focused on building this bilinear pairing. All right, so that's, that's the first signpost. Okay, how are we actually going to build the pairing though? Well, that's going to come from something called heights or height theory. So that properly, properly marks our, our next section. So let's talk heights. Okay. So intuitively, heights measure arithmetic complexity. And this, this can be made precise. One thing that we'll see is, you know, we have this condition on the pairing that um, if you pair something with itself and, and you want it to be less than some finite bound, then that gives you a finite set. This should be viewed if we're going to build our pairing from heights as saying, okay, if we're placing this kind of height restriction on our data, then that's saying it has high arithmetic complexity and having high arithmetic complexity, well, there should be comparatively less stuff um, that has that amount of complexity. So that's, that's one intuitive rule of thumb to maybe have in mind, although um, as stated, it's not anything precise, but yes. So they measure arithmetic complexity. How? Well, here's one, one thing. Um, and again, there are a million different notions of height in arithmetic geometry and number theory. This is just one. Okay. Um, okay. So, Again, we have K of global field. I just want to remind everybody of that. This will be very important today. All right. <clears throat> so how is the standard height defined? So the standard height or standard height function, but I'll leave off function because it's implicit. The standard height, uh, let's say H, K n, where n here is some positive integer, is a map defined from the k bar points of uh, pr projective n space to the non-negative real numbers. And it's defined by, well, how can we think of uh, the the uh, k bar points of of rational or sorry projective n space. Well, one way is to view it as um, 
as the following. So, you know, if we think of this as basically being, uh, give me affine n plus one space, remove zero, and then quotient by the action of GM, that is by uh, scalar multiplication by units, then um, we should be able to think of, of elements here, or although I think this should be k bar. Okay. So if we think of it in this way, then basically the points that we're looking at are just homogeneous tuples of, of n plus one uh, numbers that come from some finite extension of k. So namely, we take such a tuple, which again is defined in, in homogeneous coordinates. So I'll say it's, it's t0 through tn. And it's going to map to um, the following. So I'm going to take a sum over places coming from k, where I'll define what k is in a second. And we want to care about the following. So we're going to maximize over all the coordinates. And we'll take our coordinate values. And, and then we'll take their, um, their, their normalized w adic valuation. Uh, but then this thing needs to be normalized. So we normalize by the degree of the extension. And finally, what's k here? Well, with k, not that k, this k. So this will be a finite extension of k containing T0 through Tn. All right, so let me, let me um, unpack this a little bit more, right? So first of all, we take our tuple of coordinates and we note to ourselves that since they all live in k bar, that means that each of them lives in some finite extension of k, little k. Um, and hence, all of them are contained inside of some finite extension, big K, of little k. So that's what this, this end result is saying, or this end assumption. Um, and then the sum that we're sending it to, well, because big K is a, um, a finite extension of little k, then we can extend all the places in, in a natural way. This is just um, a result from algebraic number theory. And then the result that we take here where we are involving these, these normalized uh, W adic valuations or absolute values, how is that defined? Well, so let's say this. So recall that, I'll just say T W is um, this raised to, I guess, Epsilon w. So, okay, <laughs> there are two things that have to be defined here, right? This, uh, this absolute value with respect to w and then um, epsilon w. So epsilon w is, is, I think, the easier of the two to understand. It's just this. So it's, um, it's two if w is a, a, quote, complex place and it's one otherwise. I don't want to get too much into this. Uh, if you're not familiar with the underlying algebraic number theory, uh, I would just check the notes. Uh, note that if you have a global function field, this doesn't matter at all because there aren't any complex places. But yeah, it's, it's not terribly important. This is a normalization condition. That's why I, I said it was normalized. Um, and uh, this guy, the, uh, the W adic absolute value is, well, the Let's say natural, maybe natural is not quite the right word, but it's, it's the natural extension of V for V in sigma little k, the underlying place, right? So recall that we can think of places as equivalence classes of absolute values. And so 
W is lifting a place from K, little k. Um, so there's a corresponding absolute value in that class, and we can lift that absolute value in, in a natural way to a place on, or to an absolute value on, on big K, and that's what we do here. Um, okay. So why should we care about this? Well, historically, people thought about um, heights for number fields, and, and in particular, they originally thought about heights for Q. Um, and I, I don't, I'm not actually terribly familiar with the history, but I, the, the little that I did read about it, it's pretty interesting um, how people first stumbled on the notion of heights. So heights have a, a long and varied history where they've been used to do all kinds of things. And this is one sort of thing they've been used for. Um, again, uh, some, some sources that go with number fields don't have or have different kinds of normalizations in place. And that's because if you're working over Q, you're in characteristic zero. And so what you choose to do with fractions and so on is a lot easier because there aren't any, you know, there aren't any things that you have to worry about not appearing in the denominator, I guess besides zero, but that's probably obvious. Anyhow, um, this, this height formula is going to be really important for us um, in, in a kind of interesting way. Uh, but you know, before, before I get to that, I should say that you know, there are some things to check when you write this formula down, right? For one, you want to know that if I choose different homogeneous coordinates, that I should get the same Sorry, if I, if I choose um, different representatives for the same set of homogeneous coordinates, then I should get the same answer. And uh, that's true. The reason for that is, is actually fairly simple. There is a result from number theory. So, so let me see, say here that, um, so invariance under multiplication by some Le that's not lambda, lambda in, oh gosh, where should lambda live? Well, let's say it lives in k cross, right? Invariance under multiplication by lambda um, follows from the place, or, or follows from the, uh, what's it called, the, the product formula. And what does the product formula say? Well, it says that the product over all of the places, ah, there we go. The product over all the places um, normalized with the normalized uh, absolute values, this is one, right? So then taking logarithms of both sides shows that the extra contribution you would get vanishes. Okay, so there's the invariance and then you also need to check invariance under the choice of, of big K. Um, that's not hard, but it's a calculation that's not terribly enlightening and I don't want to spend time on it, so I'll leave it to you um, or the notes. And then finally, you need to check uh, for well-definedness reasons. I said that uh, this, this number we get is supposed to be non-negative and um, the fact that it is non-negative, well, really, all that amounts to is because you have homogeneous coordinates, you can arrange that one of them is one, right? Because at least one of them is non-zero, so you can divide by it. And that means that um, when you're looking at this maximum, right, at least one thing, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you can always arrange that the log of one of these guys is always going to be taking log of one, which is zero. Um, and so you're always adding up a bunch of things that are at least zero. And so this thing is non-negative. Okay. Cool. So, um, yeah, well, let me think for a second. Okay, right. So basically, we know that the height function is invariant under like scalar multiplication by some lambda as above, right? And we might hope more generally 
Uh, so, so one might hope That should be an H. H, Kn, our standard height function is invariant under a general change of coordinates. On uh, this projective N space. Uh, but it turns out that that's not true. So what is true is that H K N is, so if we look at what the, um, the group of change of coordinates of this space is, and that's going to be PGL N plus one of K. Um, so H K N is PGL N plus one K invariant. Uh, up to bounded functions, so up to O of one. Uh, so that's precisely the content of this lemma, which I, I will leave to you guys. And it's again, a fairly elementary result to check, but you know, I, I think that it's important to spend time on other things. So again, K is a global field and, and N is a positive integer. Then if I give you some S in PGL N plus one, of K, okay, there we go. <laughs> then uh, the function that I obtain just as the standard height function, this is similar, uh, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by similar, to, well, the height function, but precomposed with our change of coordinates. And when I say similar here, so, F is similar to G if, and I suppose if and only if, um, F minus G is bounded. And FG here are functions from somewhere, the somewhere doesn't matter particularly to R. So this, this similarity notion, or, or we'll be encountering this kind of setup enough that it's important to, it's useful to have a shorthand. So that's what this equivalence relation is. It's a equivalence up to O of one, up to bounded functions. Okay. So, um, right, so, so we've, we've gotten through defining, you know, what the standard height function is. We've talked about um, some of its invariance properties and sort of motivated why we want to care about um, equivalence up to bounded functions. And this is something that we will tackle a lot in the next few minutes, but I think that this is a good break point. So I'm going to stop it here and we will resume at 1110. Uh, so I guess we should pause the recording. As, as Leon just pointed out, you know, if you have a projective variety, which is ultimately what we're going to want to apply this to, namely to A, which we know is projective, um, our building variety, then um, you know, we're going to need to care about the embedding and we're going to need to um, care about possibly uh, what happens if we vary degree. Um, and so the following lemma actually deals with this. So let's have X be a uh, projective K scheme. And let's have L be a very ample line bundle on X, uh, which, you know, as a very ample line bundle has an associated uh, closed embedding.
I sub L, right, which goes from, I guess, X uh, to the projectivization of the global sections of L. Okay. So then at the same time, let's have F be a function from X to projective N space and possibly different from whatever the dimension of this projective space. Um, so this will be, you know, a k-morphism. No surprises. Such that, oh, well, all that we really care about, you know, f f could do a lot of different things, but but really the only condition we need on it is that it pulls back o of one, where this is o of you know p and k of one. Um, to L. If that's the case, then um, the following are the same. So, so then HF is similar to HIL. So what's HF? HF is just uh, take the standard height function with respect to N and precompose with F then this is take the standard height function with respect to D, where D is the associated dimension for this uh, projective space, and precompose that with your embedding. So the claim is that these guys are equivalent uh, modulo bounded functions. Okay. So um, what, what I should say, first of all, is that um, the, the choice of this map, IL, right, the embedding, depends on a choice of global sections of my very ample line bundle L. Um, but the previous result, which I, which I mentioned, says that that kind of change of coordinates doesn't matter. Um, so already, you know, the ambiguity defined by, or the ambiguity introduced by having this map is eliminated, so that's good. Um, second, uh, what this result says is that um, the choice of embedding of projective space doesn't matter, which is really, really important. Okay. So this is what we want. And I don't think I have time to go into the full details of the proof. Um, again, this is a mostly computational result, so I don't, uh, I generally don't find such results to be terribly enlightening um, in lecture to go through the proof. So I will not go into exhaustive detail. Okay, so by the previous lemma, we can um, change coordinates. on our projective space. So that um, f of x is non-degenerate. And so uh, what, what this means equivalently is that the pullback map which acts on global sections. So namely, it acts on global sections of, well, we have our, our projective space, and we have the line bundle, which is O of 1. And then that maps us to global sections of L. Uh, we want this to be injective. Right, so um, this, is, this is just a result from basic algebraic number theory. All that it's saying is that non-degeneracy here is saying that the, the image is not contained in a hyperplane. And that's tied to, um, well, to coordinat coordinatization. And um, shoot, what am I trying to say here? Well, yeah, if you think about what this pullback map is on global sections, then uh, you know, the, the way that we think about global sections of projective end spaces in terms of hyperplanes. So this is not, um, this is not anything mysterious. Okay. 
So we have this condition. Why does it matter? Well, because it will make it easy to relate the two height functions, right? So our modified height function with respect to f and our modified height function with respect to um, the embedding uh, associated to L. OK. So there, there are two sides to this claim, right? So we need, so, so let me say it this way. So, so here are the two components, right? So one is that HF is less than or equal to HIL. And two, so we all put a separator or something. Two is that in the opposite direction, HIL is less than or equal to HF. Uh, but it will no longer be true that, you know, this is a bound on the nose. And so we have to introduce a bounded factor, an error term. So unsurprisingly, the second one's going to be harder to show because we have to think about an error term. Uh, yeah. So let me say this. Okay. So these are, these are our goals. Um, one, I won't go into too, too much detail. Uh, really, one follows almost automatically from this injectivity condition. Uh, you just choose suitable coordinates on the global sections uh, of, well, okay, let, let me write it out. It, 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 it's, it's not that bad. Okay, so, so yeah. So let's have T0 through Tn be a K basis of uh, this guy, the global sections of O of 1. Right, recall that we can think of the global sections as, uh, shoot, what, what am I thinking here? Sorry, we think of them as, as homogeneous uh, degree one polynomials in n variables or n plus one variables. Okay, so let it be a k basis and this extends to a k basis z naught through zd of the global sections of L under f pullback. So this is a bit sloppy. What this means is that take z0, take z naught through zn to be the images of t naught through tn under f pullback, and then extend that basis to a basis of the global sections of L. Okay. Uh, so then, so after possibly uh, changing coordinates, once again, uh, this map uh, IL, right, the projective embedding, can just be written as this, right, where each of them receives an argument, OK? And this implies rather easily that, so, so I'll say this is for one. This implies rather easily that, that uh, the height function associated to f is less than or equal to the height function associated to il, uh, because what we have is that um, hil will just be taking a sum over more numbers. So the maximum could only go up. Okay, nothing, nothing too fancy. So then what about the second bound, right? That's the one that's arguably a little harder and the one that I will not go into full detail on. Uh, right, so by assumption, so X is covered by <clears throat> the open pre-images of what? Well, of these guys, the D pluses of ZJ, which is given by, by pulling back uh, 
d plus of tj for j oh let me think here Since they're given by pulling back these sections, tj, it's between 0 and n. And moreover, what we can say, so, so this implies that the, uh, the 0 locus of all these guys which sits inside of X is empty. Okay. So then um, since L is very ample, right, the embedding that's associated to it is, well, it's a closed embedding. Um, and so that means that it's image, right? So the image of IL is going to be, sorry. So I, IL is giving for us a, uh, a closed subscheme of a projective space, right? So we know what that will look like, right? So, so here's what we can say. So, uh, image of I L is proj of S. For S given by so take the uh, polynomials in uh, these d plus one variables, mod out by an appropriate homogeneous ideal. And this will be contained, of course, in this, which is just a standard result. You sum over the global sections of, of tensor powers of R, all right? Cool. So then inside of here, we have an ideal generated by the first n plus one variables. Right, so really they should have like bars over them because we're talking about the quotients of these, of these guys. That's okay. Um, it satisfies that, well, proj of S mod J is proj of S intersected with the zero locus of the sections. sorry, the sections, uh, which is zero, right? Again, by, by fiat. Um, oh, sorry, empty. Okay, so um, what this says is that we can apply the null stolen sots. So, all right, let me see if I spell this right. So null stolen sots, I think that's right. Right. That implies by the no stolen sorts that, um, you know, z n plus one, that z through, sorry, <laughs> the ideal generated by the, these coordinates uh, has a nil potent image An S mod J. All right, what's all this algebraic nonsense that's going on? Well, really, the point here is that, again, we're trying to get a relationship between HIL and, um, we're trying to get a relationship between HIL and HF, right? And in particular, we want to have an upper bound. So let me, let me remind you guys. We want to have an upper bound of HF on HIL up to some bounded error term, right? 
So how are we going about constructing that error term? Well, what we're trying to do really is, um, well, well, actually it should, it should become apparent in just a second. So let me, let me say just a little bit more and then it should become really apparent what it is that, that we're hoping to do. Um, I, I probably should have uh, laid this argument out a little bit better, but um, my apologies. Okay, so what this means, right? These guys having no potent image says that um, there's some E positive such that Z M plus one to the E through Z D to the E, uh, these guys, which again, land in J, satisfy take their eth power, and this is a sum from 0 to n of data relating to the first few coordinates. So that's an i, it's modulo i. And fij here is, so, polynomial in d plus one variables, homogeneous of degree e minus one. Okay, <clears throat> so why does this matter? Here's why. We have, a, we have something like this, so So I, I should have said that this was our goal from the first first part, right? Or for, from the from the start. Okay. So what 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 the heck is going on? So sorry. Okay. So we want to bound HIL from above by HF, right? So what we say to ourselves is, okay, we can't use HIL on the nose, but what we can do is introduce some kind of scalar multiple to the front, because what this does, right? HIL is built up from basically a sum of a bunch of logs or you know, max of, of log. Uh, so if we introduce a scalar factor of E, then we're going to raise the stuff we're taking logarithms of to the eth power. Okay. So then what we can do is use uh, you know, this, this algebraic geometry result, right, which tells us this relationship of the latter coordinates, which is data that is not going to be captured by HF, to the first few, uh, sorry, yes, it's going to tie the data of, of the, the latter coordinates, you know, the m plus one through d stuff, which isn't tied to HF, to stuff that does come from HF. And so what we can do is basically separate off the, the extra data that we don't know what to do with um, as a constant C that's independent of the point we're looking at. And the rest gets put into E minus one copies of HIL and a copy of HF. And so if you subtract off E minus one copies of HL from both sides, then what you get is exactly the kind of bound that you want. So uh, I, I don't want to go through all the comp computations to uh, obtain what this constant C is and so on, but, but trust me that it works out. Um, and again, if you want a precise value for C and so on, you can look in the notes and I, I give you a big ugly expression for what C actually is. Um, but yeah, sorry, that was a little bit confusing. Uh, the, the point of this lemma is that we can change coordinates. Basically, we don't need to worry about the choice of projective embedding if we have a projective scheme and we want to have a notion of height function defined on it. So that's, that's the takeaway here. Um, and, and the way that we obtain it is, again, by doing a little bit of linear algebra, doing some basic algebraic geometry using those stolen thoughts, and then writing down this nice equation 
and, and showing, you know, basically checking, checking that this works um, and, and checking independence, right? So C here is a, there's my cursor. So C is a, a constant uh, independent of X. Okay. So let me leave that at that. Uh, please, please let me know if you have questions. Again, we're, we're, getting, we're getting very close to the finishing stretch. Okay, so this result that we just proved, right, about being able to vary the projective embedding um, has itself an extension uh, whose proof I don't think I'll have time to get into, which is okay. Um, but I invite you to check the notes. So this is called Bayes' theorem. Maybe I should have said, or Bayes' thesis. I mean, it is also Bayes' theorem. I um, mean, this is actually what, uh, what they proved in, in his dissertation. Uh, so here's what it says. There exists a unique assignment of pairs, XL with X, a projective case scheme. and L, a line bundle on X. Note that it doesn't have to be very ample, be any line bundle. Two functions, and again, notice that everything we've been doing so far is up to O of one equivalence, right? So that'll be important here. So to functions H, K, L, which the K will often be redundant, so I'll say HL, but know that K doesn't matter in this whole picture, um, which map from the K bar points of X to R. Mod bounded functions, so, so mod O of one, so I'll just say mod O of one. Satisfying what? Well, the first one, I don't I think if I were to go back, I would rearrange these, but that's okay. So the first one is that um, it has a homomorphism type property, right? So if I give you a uh, product of line bundles, a tensor product, then again, equality here means mod O of one. Then the height, associated to the tensor product is the sum of the heights. Okay. A normalization condition, which says that if I plug in projective space with O of one, uh, then I get the standard height function. So this should give you a hint of how to build this thing. And then it has a naturality condition under pullback. So if I take um, a line bundle, so I'll say, uh, oh, like that. So this is for F X, uh, how do I want to say this? Yeah, yeah, X prime to X, amorphism, projective case schemes, and L, L here is a line bundle on X, of course, okay? So, um, yeah, let, let, let's talk about how you build this thing, right? And as is the case with these kinds of results about, you know, I give you some conditions and I say there's a unique thing that does it, then what you do is you use the conditions to build it, right? So let, let's talk about what you do, right? You want to have a generalized height function available for any line bundle on any projective scheme. So we know from condition two here that projective space gives rise to the standard height function, right? So that's how we start. We say, all right, 
um, <laughs> do this, right? Then if I have a, um, a projective scheme in a very ample line bundle, what I'll do is I'll send it to HL or to HIL, right? HIL was defined previously, right? And then what do you do if you have um, a general line bundle, right? On a general projective scheme. Well, what you can do is um, you can actually write any projective, sorry, you can write any very ample line bundle as a, essentially a quotient of very, oh my gosh, <laughs> sorry. Let me write this out so that I'm not confusing people. Right, so proof. Oh shoot, sorry. So to P N K O of one, associate the standard height function. And then to a pair X L, L very ample, associate H I L. Okay, and then for general X and general L, so right L is isomorphic to um, M tensor N inverse. M and N both very ample. And then take HL to be HM, shoot, HM minus HN. Okay. And then you check that this works, right? So it should be obvious that you'll get this, this uh, homomorphism additivity type condition. Uh, you obviously get two because you rigged it. And then three is the only one that requires some care because um, if you pull back by general morphisms, you don't know what will happen, right? If you pull back by a finite guy, well, finite morphisms will preserve ampleness, but they need not preserve very ampleness. And I give an example of that in the, in the notes. Um, so if you have a general morphism, it doesn't suffice to just, um, it, there's some care, there's some care. And the way that you get around this is that you basically factor the morphism F into its graph and a projection. And then it turns out that graph morphisms and projection morphisms, it's easy to check this result for them. And then, um, you know, by, then the result falls. But I, I don't want to say too much more about that. So, Vase thesis defines for us a, a well-defined, at least up to bounded functions, height for every projective scheme and every choice of line bundle on that scheme. Uh, and so this gives rise to, to a definition, which I won't bother to write as a definition, but um, so any function that goes from the k bar points of x to R representing uh, HL, right? The thing associated to the pair is called a V height. And it's called A because again, there is some ambiguity. All right. So recall that um, we have, we're trying to build a bilinear pairing on the K, the K points of A, right? Well, to get that bilinear pairing, it makes sense that we're, we're going to need some kind of, well, we're gonna need some positive semi-definite thing, right? And to get some positive semi, getting ahead of myself. Okay, let me not say that. Let me say this, all right? So we have, we have our V height, right? 
And this is going to directly give us um, the pairing that we're looking for, and it's, we're going to get in the following way. So if I've lost some of you a little bit, I'm sorry. Let me, let me try to remedy that. Um, so if I have gamma, any abelian group, right? And I have a function h, h here is suggested because, well, we'll be seeing a height function in a second. Uh, satisfying uh, this. So if I map a triple x, y, z to h of x plus y plus z, you know, minus h, x plus y, blah, 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 plus h of z. Hopefully it's clear like what this expression is, right? I, I, uh, I add the triple, I subtract off the pairwise sums, and then I add in the singular parts or the, the, you know, choosing one at a time. A function satisfying that this is bounded, so it's zero up to O of one, is almost quadratic. If you're almost quadratic, you're well on your way to defining a bilinear pairing. And if you have something that's actually quadratic on the nose, well, then you're really in business for defining a pairing. So that's, that's where this is going. Um, the fact that we're seeing something like this, right? You add up the triple, you subtract off the pairs, and then you add in the singular bits, then this should remind you of something. Namely, it should remind you of when we were talking about the theorem of the square. Um, and that's not any coincidence, right? So the theorem of the square tells us that, um, well, HL, for any line bundle on an abelian variety, mapping from the k-bar points is almost quadratic. Great. So Tate, who again was looking to build a bilinear pairing, had the wise idea that, oh, so I have this almost quadratic height. Can I get a quadratic height from it and use that to build a bilinear pairing? And the answer is yes. So um, here's what Tate proved, theorem. Ah. So if we have, um, again, gamma is an abelian group, and h, a real valued function on gamma, which is almost quadratic, then there exists unique uh, symmetric bilinear, uh, let's say B, from gamma across gamma to R, and linear L from gamma to R, such that uh, H is similar, so this means again, equivalent, equ sorry, equivalent up to bounded functions to the following, this function. So again, h is a function defined on um, gamma, right? So we need to associate data for b. Like b takes in pairs, right? So the most obvious way for b to take in a pair of data given only a single number is to just use the diagonal map, right? So put in two copies of the same number. And then we normalize by a factor of a half. And the claim is that this function over here, which is an honest quadratic function, so half of you know b composed delta plus l is an honest quadratic function and then that is similar to our function that we care about initially um, and so if we apply this to hl 
right? So shoot yields what's called the Tate canonical height. And it's, its canonicity comes from the, the uniqueness of these two things. Um, and this is if often written HL with a hat. Why a hat? I don't know, but it has a hat. <laughs> okay. And so then uh, the final step is that, well, this take canonical height puts us in business. So um, I guess let's first of all write our take canonical height in terms of the pieces that it's built from, right? So it's obviously going to be built from some B sub L composed with delta plus um, some L sub L. Okay, so the theorem is this. Let A over K be an abelian variety. Um, let's have L and L prime line bundles on A. And let's have um, F a morphism. of abelian varieties, okay? So then here's what we can say. And again, this is a pretty pretty uh, straightforward theorem to prove with only one part that really requires much work. And uh, we, we won't actually get into it, which is okay. So five things, the five things we need, right? So the first one is obvious that the way it behaves with a tensor product is equality Okay, and this is not equality up to bounded functions. This is equality on the nose. Um, it is the height associated to L plus the height associated to L prime. Okay, obvious because this guy is quadratic, right? Um, second, it behaves nicely with respect to pullback, again, on the nose. But notice that we're not pulling back by anything now. This is a morphism of abelian varieties. So it does have a lot of structure. Okay. Precompose with F. Again, this follows directly from what we said before. So no, no surprises there. Um, if L is symmetric, then the linear part vanishes. This sort of argument should not be, um, this sort of argument should be very familiar to people, right? Remember that L was symmetric, so if and only if it's isomorphic to the minus one pullback of itself, right? Um, so this is, this is analogous to uh, a result that you would expect about bilinear pairings, right? If you have, um, shoot. well, yeah, think about it like this. Uh, you, you can get a, hmm. Let me let me not get too into it. I mean, you, you should see how to prove this. It's very straightforward. Okay. Um, if L is ample and symmetric, maybe the idea here is that the minus one factor, uh, you can put the minus one factor in the second part of, you know what, never mind. I, I'm not gonna worry about that. Okay. So, If L is ample and symmetric, then our take canonical height, which will just be um, it will just be half of this guy, right? Because again, the linear part vanishes. Sorry, like that. Uh, it will be positive semi-definite. So maybe PSD. 
And the last one is that, again, if, if L is ample and symmetric, so I'll just say this, then the set, which is the following, that's not what I want, there we go. Give me the K bar points of A, such that, okay, I put a bound on the degree of the extension associated to our point. What's that bound? Well, let's say it's bounded by D. And if I put a bound on height, right, which again is like bounding arithmetic complexity, this is finite. for all D and C. Okay, finishing stretch guys. So as I noted, right, one and two follow pretty much automatically from the results we proved for Ve heights. Okay, so nothing, nothing bad there. The fact that linear part vanishes, I sort of uh, stumbled through not very elegantly, but um, it's, it's extremely straightforward to check, and I, I leave it to you. Uh, for four, L being ample symmetric implies that this thing is positive and definite. I want to unpack that. And then five, I won't prove. Um, I, I leave it to the notes. This is the only one that requires a bit of work, um, but it rests on a, a classical result, so it follows from something called Northcott's theorem which goes way back. Okay, so again, I'll just merely touch on the proof of four. And what did we do? Well, um, <clears throat> L is ample, right? So that implies that M, which we can take to be um, L tensor to the N, is, is uh, very ample. For a large enough N, right? Okay. Which gives, of course, that M is isomorphic to the associated, oh my goodness, the associated projective embedding pulling back a structure sheath uh, twisted by one, over one, right? So then by using Vase thesis, what we can say is that the associated Tate canonical height is similar, not equal, to this guy. The Vey height or any any choice of Vey height representing the projective embedding. Okay, which I will remind is given by H of um, some appropriate dimension, so H of K sub capital N maybe, uh, composed with I. All right, cool. So then, by multiplicativity, right? H M M, oh my goodness, is N times H L, right? And that's similar to H I M. So that implies that N H L, the take canonical height, is equal to H of I sub M plus a bounded term epsilon. And the function HIM is, remember, non-negative, right? Which means that epsilon can only take on, uh, you know, it can't take on arbitrarily negative values, right? And that means that the take canonical height, so, so this implies that take canonical height is bounded below. But then if you study orbits of points, right, where you look at multiples of um, 
any particular point that you plug in, you see that, and this is just a calculation, but you see that the um, either it vanishes, in which case non-negativity is clear, or it keeps growing in absolute value. And so if it took on any negative values at all at a point, then it would have to take on arbitrarily negative values and it couldn't possibly be bounded below. So this says that um, the take canonical height is non-negative. And this is precisely the positive semi-definite condition that we wanted. So let's tie everything together, working from Bayes' thesis. All right, so let A over K be our abelian variety. Then um, using that A is projective, choose L ample on A. And consider the pairing, which I'll write as a sub k, or a, or a over k rather, which goes from a of k cross a of k to r, obtained by restricting the take canonical height. So the take canonical height L. What am I even saying here? Well, no, sorry. We don't restrict that. We want to restrict, um, it needs to have two arguments, right? So we want to restrict BL. Uh, it satisfies all of the desired conditions. And so, the mortal vape theorem follows. And the last thing that I'll say in the last minute that I have is, you know, you might wonder, okay, we went to all the trouble earlier to construct the duel, right? But the duel didn't really appear here. What's up? Well, um, <clears throat> it turns out that if you look at a general, a general abelian variety A, there isn't a canonical choice of an ample line bundle or a very ample line bundle for that matter. Um, but if we look at A crossed with A dual, right? So on A crossed with A dual, I guess over K, uh, we have the Poincaré bundle, which it turns out is ample. So I'll write it as P sub A. So the associated pairing which is denoted uh, this way is called the um, the neuron tate height Because it's defined on the, the so, so the associated height, I should say, is defined on the k-bar points of A cross A dual, which gives us, you know, k points or k-bar points of A and k-bar points of A dual. So it has two arguments and that's why you get a pairing. So this is slightly sloppily stated, but you do get a pairing on things coming from A and A dual. This is called the neuron Tate height. And um, this particular height has Lots of classical applications, lots of non-classical applications that are extremely important in number theory and to some extent preceded a lot of this theory. Uh, so, um, you know, the reason why we care about the dual is, you know, if you're maybe a more classical number theorist, then you'd be coming at things from this angle and the dual naturally appears there. So, um, yeah, that's the gist of how you prove 
the Mordelvey theorem, particularly from the theory of heights um, and using the weak Mordelvey theorem. And yeah, that's all I had to say for this course. So thank you for joining me. And um, if you have any questions, then please ask.